And now I can share. I think it's recording. Yep, yep. it is. Okay. Yep, all right. Sorry about that, everybody. Do you think we'd be we'd be super good at uh, COVID, at um, this sort of thing after uh, COVID, right? Um, if some of you can, I don't know if some of you, I could, uh, all right, Dory and Jess, are you co-hosts at all? Um, I don't think I'm listed as a co-host, no. Okay. I'm not a co-host either, but um, I'm happy to just jump in if you want to be in charge of moving things forward. Um, I can just jump in where it's appropriate if that works and then that's yeah. easy. I just want to be sure that if somebody comes in late, they can still get in. Ah. So... I may have to stop the share and make one of you a co-host here. Jim, would you like me to share the slides so that you can? Uh, can I uh, name, make co-host? No, I, I'll go, I don't mind going through the sides, but Dory, I've made you a co-host. So you can watch for any guests that come. Perfect, thank you. Okay, good. So great books for main classrooms. That's the, that's the focus of today's um, webinar. And so we're going to talk about different books that we've, we've used in all of our classrooms. Um, and so it's broken down fairly sensibly, elementary, middle, high school, also uh, with Dory's expertise in visual and performing arts. Um, we're going to talk about some books that uh, are, can be used in those capacities. And then a brief discussion and then a little bit of information about gaining contact hours for participating in this. Uh, if you do have a chat, put it into the chat and, uh, and any questions or we'll try and put some links in there. If you have any suggestions about links, you know, put that into the chat as well and share with each other. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about are a bit uh, elementary classroom reads that some of you may be familiar with, some not, but um, still, I think they'll be really useful. Um, so I'll get started. This is a, a page that I made. This is from my wife, mostly talking with my wife. I teach high school, but my wife has taught elementary school for more than 20 years, and she's an expert on literacy. And so these are some of the books that she absolutely loves. And she and I asked her the other day, I said, what's the one book you could go without in your classroom? And she wouldn't speak to me because she can't decide on some of them. But she mostly does this by author. And her three most, her three favorite, well, or two of her favorites are Mo Willems, and Kevin Henke's, um, but she has a whole host of other authors she looks at. But these are the books that she really uses all the time, every year, without exception. And the first, and my favorite too, we used to read this, we have two boys who my youngest is now graduating from high school this month, um, is Nuffle, Knuffle, are you supposed to pronounce it Knuffle Bunny, um, by Mo Willems. And he's got some great websites as well, if you go to it, and he's got a series of books about it. But first of all, just the graphics on it are absolutely fabulous. And he um, he has, you know, real, um, you know, non-iconic images. So he's got photographs for the background, and then the characters are iconic, right? So they're, they're cartoon characters. And he has a whole series. And um, it's a lot of this is from the point of view of the kid, or it's brought down to the level of the child. And then it deals with uh, different issues that kids this age will be going through. Like in the very first one, he takes his um, his daughter, um, who's very young, so she hasn't doesn't have much hair, to the grocery mat and loses her knuffle bunny. Her knuffle bunny. The kid has a fit, and he he doesn't understand what's wrong, and he has to deal with it. And he gets home, and it's his wife that actually says, "Where's knuffle bunny?" And so these are similar things that her students have to deal with, and they just absolutely love it. They can't get enough of the book or the stories, and so he's come out with a series of these as well. I don't know if any of you at the younger levels are familiar with it, but um, I love it too. I mean, as it, you know, somebody at, at the high school level, it's a great book too. Um, and then Mo Williams also writes, uh, they're called Elephant and Piggy. My wife calls them Gerald and Piggy because that's the name of the elephant. Really simple to read. They have uh, words that the kids can understand all on their own, um, all about very similar emotional situations that the kids are experiencing in their own life. And uh, good, good for young readers that are just trying to get through it. And they love the characters. So it's a really powerful um, way for them to engage in literacy. Um, and then uh, she said, I, probably uh, this is her favorite, Kitten's First Full Moon by Kevin Henkes, who's another great writer. Uh, and I'll go to that website. He's got a great website, too. Very often, particularly with the... Um, the picture books, the authors have super websites with activities that, that can work. And so this is a black and white book and you wouldn't think it would be this compelling, but she says the kids adore it. It's a super story. 
and he uses simple drawings to tell a good story. And then the kids, uh, her students are able to sort of adapt that approach and believe, well, this is, this is a great story and it's only in black and white. And then they can adapt the same style in their own books when they're, cause that's how she teaches, you know, storytelling and writing is first by drawing the pictures and then writing about them. And um, we're actually looking through our son's stuff now that he's graduating. And that was the way he learned as well. He went to the same school. Uh, Wemberly Worried is another one uh, by Kevin Henkes, where they're, um, you know, the, this very concerned, anxious, it's really appropriate now, given the amount of anxiety within society, uh, about how to deal with anxiety and where it comes from, what causes it, and, and for kids to try and, you know, connect with that at a young age and figure it out and cope with it. Uh, and this is another one of our favorites here, When Spring Comes. Um, Kevin Henkes has a whole series of books about the seasons, and this is one of her favorites. That whole series is something she couldn't do without. And then uh, Mo Willems also has a book about, um, this is not a good idea. This actually isn't one of his pop most famous ones, but my wife really enjoys it because uh, the chicks keep saying that's not a good idea because you think that this wolf is luring this goose into a, a trap when in reality at the end, it's the goose that's lured the wolf. And it keeps the chicks keep saying that's not a good idea. And then in the end, you realize that the, the goose knows what she's doing. So super series of books. If you don't have any for your classroom at the younger levels, these are sh assured to be favorites among your students. And there's usually a whole series of these that you can work with. Uh, and so I think, is this uh, Jess? Yeah, these are a few titles that um, I wanted to share and, and I'll give a little disclaimer. So I teach high school. I've taught high school for next year will be my eighth year teaching high school. Uh, before that, for a short time, I worked as um, an elementary school librarian in a three through five school. So that's where I had a lot of my experience sharing um, picture books, middle grade books. Uh, and honestly, I what an awesome age group to work with and what an awesome position. I feel so lucky that I had that time. Um, so I'm not currently teaching young ones in the classroom, but I am very interested in, I'm a social studies teacher. I am the DOE civics teacher leader fellow, and I'm really interested in helping educators at all levels uh, celebrate the fact that we're all civics teachers. We are all always trying to help young people imagine themselves as um, actors with agency in their own lives, in their communities, in the nation, um, to imagine uh, how they can build communities of respect and empathy. I feel like elementary school teachers are actually some of the best civics teachers we have because you spend so much of your day thinking about um, how to instill in those young learners ideas um, centered around civic values, like being kind to each other, keeping our space clean and um, being a positive force in the school. So, so my background is not uh, currently in working in an elementary school, but as part of my work with the DOE this year, I've been really doing a lot of reading and investigating of newer um, picture books, especially some middle level fiction as well, but are the, what is coming out right now or in the recent past that can help young people think civically in a really broad sense? So imagine themselves as part of communities, imagine themselves as uh, agents of change in their communities. And th this is just like a tiny sampling. There is so much good stuff out there. Um, this has actually really ma made me miss that time when I was buying books for an elementary school library because there's so much good stuff. Uh, but these are a few that that really I thought would be I could imagine reading with uh, maybe some younger like first grade, second grade audiences, but definitely that upper elementary third, fourth, fifth grade audiences, I think that kids would really connect with a lot of these stories and ask wonderful questions. Um, so a couple that I wanted to talk about, Night in the City is actually a great book for really younger grades, like even, even kindergarten. Um, and I included it as a, as a civics book because it's about, um, it's really looking at in, in a, an unnamed city 
what are the jobs that are happening at night? What are people doing out there in the city that en enable the community to keep running? Like what's going on out there when a little kid might be in their house? Like there's still people that are out doing important things that kind of keep the wheels of the town going. Um, and I think it's just such, if we're thinking really broadly about what civics is, how each of us plays a role in our community and has responsibilities to ourselves and our families and our in our towns that we live in, it's just a really nice book to think about what is it that people do to make the community run? Like what is required of us? Um, and some of those things have to happen at night. And that's such a different thing for most kids to feel, uh, to think about unless they, unless they might have a parent who has a night job too. So um, it's a really fun book to think broadly about like, how do, how do communities work? What is What kinds of jobs have to happen um, for our towns to run? Uh, another for maybe younger grades, but you could definitely, it's, it's a simple enough text for younger grades, but you, it has some really complicated nuanced themes. So you could definitely bring it up with uh, third, fourth graders is My Two Border Towns, which is a newer book. It is a, on the surface, a really simple story. There's a little boy who lives in a um, border city in Texas and his dad wakes him up in the morning um, and they're going to run errands on the other side of the border. Uh, and so it, it shows them crossing the border and then what, it, what are the types of errands they're running in the other town? They might be visiting friends and family while they're there. And then it shows them coming back um, over the border and they have to wait. Uh, it shows that while they, they know that they're gonna make it over the border, but they see other people who are kind of camping out and wishing they could go over the border. So it doesn't, it doesn't through the text get into complicated social and political issues, um, but it offers this sort of really easy entry point for thinking about uh, complicated issues around what is a community. And, and I found this book, I was actually trying to find any sort of book for students of any age about Maine as a border state and how we have this interesting history of a lot of our communities. People have lived with family on, you know, family in Quebec and have traveled back and forth regularly. Um, and that is that is an opportunity. If anyone is a children's book author, there is like nothing really about um, no children's literature that I could find about um family, like cross-border family experiences in Maine. And I know that that is, that is part of our rich history here in the state. So if someone wants to write that book, that would be awesome. Um, but this was the book I found uh, in that quest to find something about Maine. Uh, Sharice's Big Voice is a true story about Sharice Davis or Davies. Oh, I can't remember now. She's uh, an indigenous woman who was elected to the House of Representatives recently. So this is a picture book of her, um, a very simplistic telling of her story as a young woman uh, growing up and starting to imagine herself as, as belonging to that voice of the people in charge, right? So for so many of our students, it's hard for them to see themselves in the role of decision maker. Uh, it feels, I think, for a lot of our kids, uh, that other people make choices that affect their lives and they are not uh, part of that decision-making process. And so this is about a young person finding that they actually do have a voice and they can be involved in being a decision-maker, um, but told again in a really approachable, I would say like third grade would be awesome for this book. Third grade, maybe fourth grade would be awesome for this book. Um, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to quick, quick, quick. I am like obsessed right now with connecting and infusing environmental studies and thinking about climate in like every subject area. And The Eagles Are Back uh, is such a great book. There's a whole series of these, but I love stories about the environment that offer a sense of agency and hope for young people because they absolutely hear the doom and gloom all the time. And when you can find a story about like eagle populations returning or alewives returning to our rivers, like that is such a wonderful way to frame a conversation about um, environmental science or about climate change or about whatever. Because so often these kids are hearing only, only kind of like 
really, really bleak messaging around that. So anything that can, again, help kids uh, find a sense of agency so that they're encouraged to be active citizens. Um, and the Eagles are back as part of this like long, long series, not long, maybe there are three or four books in the series, but it's uh, all sorts of efforts that have been going on in the nation over the last 50 years to uh, really bring back different, oh, wrong link. Wow. So oh, yeah, that's okay. I was trying to get to the other ones that you had. But... <laughs> Oh, I'll try to fix that. So that one's a great book too. Uh, I didn't include it on this list. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and then an American story, I'll just really briefly, uh, Kwame Alexander, I think a lot of people who maybe teach upper elementary or middle school know Kwame Alexander for, no, I've forgotten the series. Uh, he wrote like a really popular series about sports, about sports players, um, and I don't remember that, but this is a picture book that really just helps us think about um, American identity. It does have some like challenging ideas and, and I think gets at the duality of American history uh, in a really beautiful and accessible way. So it's a, it's a newer book and really great. All right. Did anybody have any questions for Jess? I will fix that link too, sorry. Uh, okay, and then we go on to some middle school books for the middle school classroom, I think. Uh, oh, so. it's me again. So much yeah. of my voice. <laughs> so um, I, the suffragist play, these are all history books and, um, but history again, thinking civically, like really asking students to reflect on uh, the role of individual people and, um, making decisions as a society. Like the suffragist playbook is really a history of the suffrage movement, but it's framed as um, here are the strategies that people used. Are those strategies that like you could use about an issue you care about? So it's a history book that reads like a, almost like a self-help book. Like this is how people got the word out and how could you get the word out? So it's a really interesting approach to a history book. And then I threw in bomb and the secret project um because kids i don't know like some of my high school kids and um i know some of my my daughter's middle school friends have been really obsessed with uh like the manhattan project i'm assuming because oppenheimer came out uh and so kids are really like interested in that i found lately and bomb is a graphic novel version of a nonfiction middle grade text that um, was also called Bomb that came out several years ago. Uh, but Bomb and the Secret Project I've used together, actually, even though they're middle, uh, middle grade, middle school, well, the Secret Project is a picture book, but even though Bomb is like for middle level students, I've used these in a high school classroom. Um, with high school history students. Uh, and they're just ways to think through kind of the human side of what it what it means to be part of uh, a country and a society building a type of weapon like the nuclear bomb. Um, and The Secret Project is actually a picture book with very, very, very few words in it. But I have gathered high school students around in a circle on the floor and read it. And it is, um, it is a really emotional experience. So that's one that I actually would not read to elementary school students, just because it's, there's something really deep going on in that story. Um, but I would, I would use that picture book in a middle school or a high school classroom, if you were teaching history about the uh, Manhattan Project, or if you were having some sort of like civic space discussion around, um, around, like issues around ethics of the atomic bomb, which I know some teachers do that as a debate. So, so Jess, if you don't mind my asking you some questions, the secret project sounds great. We do a unit on Frankenstein, and of course, the, the ethical yeah. from science are really significant. Do you think that could be used as a companion piece for them? One hundred percent. I, I, and you know, I'm someone who gets really emotional at books anyway, so I'm. I'm kind of a sap, but like when I first read The Secret Project, which I bought for our school library back, it came out, it came out when I was a librarian. So probably like eight or nine years ago now, um, I bought it just because I was curious about it. And I, 
um, you know, put the cover on and I was reading through it and I had like a gut punch reaction to it. It just, the, the illustrations are beautiful. The language is very sparse and kind of stark. Um, and, and it just left me with this sense of the weight of humans making that decision. Like it shows that there are people involved and it's almost like they become involved in something that is bigger than them and kind of runs away from their control. And it, it is a really, I think, artfully done picture book. Um, it was not a big hit with my third through fifth graders in the library because it just, it it wasn't accessible in that way. Like they wanted to know what happened, like what happened with the building of the bomb. And it doesn't give you a history of the atomic bomb. It, it has to be something that you're coming to it with some knowledge already, like, and that's what makes it have an emotional impact. Um, it's like going through pieces of art with some sparse poetry, and then you get to the end and see the explosion. And it's like, ooh, that really, you know, I, I have done, I have read it with high schoolers and asked them, like, did it make you feel differently to read this book than all of the you know, articles that we've just read about the Manhattan Project. And usually they're willing to, you know, teenagers sometimes open up and sometimes don't, but usually they're willing to say like, yeah, that really like put you in a different emotional place to think about what it felt like to be there in the desert as that first bomb went off, what it felt like to like be part of that process. Um, so I would, I would absolutely incorporate it into a high school curriculum that was thinking about the ethics of technology. Um, That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so speaking of graphic novels, I, uh, these are middle reader, but these are books appropriate for middle readers. Although I do read Beowulf. This is a, a graphic adaptation of the Beowulf story, but it's brilliant, you know, because the language sometimes in Beowulf is so um, archaic and um and you want to keep the feel of that language to keep the feel of the time period and so gareth Hines, who's an absolutely brilliant um graphic novelist he adapts he's known for adapting a lot of classic works and so if you look at all of his books um he's done the iliad the odyssey um macbeth poe uh, he's done this the whole series of books all with different art forms i mean he's a brilliant artist in his own right but my favorite is beowulf and it's good introduction to um to you know the the form of comics as well. So because I, I I like to teach thematic things with comics, I also like to teach how uh, so visual me literacy so kids understand how meaning is made and comprised from the the, the, the images and the language on each page, um, and then it, it makes them more literate consumers of the media as well. So we focus as much on the form as well as the content. And um, Rick, Rick Geary uh, on the left here, the Borden tragedy. This is a, a, he's first of all, this fabulous graphic uh, novelist who creates comics, history, nonfiction comics based on mysteries that go unsolved from the 19th and early 20th centuries, one of, one of which is the Borden tragedy, which is my favorite. I actually study this with high school students, but I think it's more geared towards middle school students. And um, the language actually is fairly sophisticated. It's based on a journal that's been found within the past 20 or 30 years based on the Borden tragedy. And for those of you, I don't, I don't mean to condescend, but the, of course, Lizzie Borden was the woman who was accused of murdering her parents with an axe in Fall River, Massachusetts, in the very early part of the 20th century. I grew up near there, near Fall River, within a half an hour's drive. So for me, Lizzie Borden was like the boogeyman. That's the story you told to scare little kids, all about Lizzie Borden. And so uh, there's actually some virtual tours you can take online. You can take field trips down there. It's not too far. Um, there's photo galleries. And so you can read the story on here, which is really accurate, very unbiased. He does a great unbiased job of it. Kids can sort of debate, read through it and debate, okay, so you think she did it or you think she didn't do it? She was actually freed at the end. She wasn't found guilty, but, um, you know, suspicions are still rampant. And um, they, the house still exists. It's used as a bed and breakfast, which is sort of creepy, but I, it's, still, it's still there. And um, so he's great, geared towards middle readers, really high interest, but equally accessible and that's probably the sign of a really good writer whatever they do can be accessible to all ages um, so both of these are, are great reads um, there's nothing really suggestive I mean obviously we're dealing with murders and stuff but he doesn't make it gory and, and the Borden tragedy Beowulf there's nothing uh, it's some violence he battles some monsters in here but it's um 
you know, about sort of an archaic society that, that uh, glory and, and violence was part of what, what they were all about. So um, this one, if you, if you want to get into comics and teach visual literacy and try and um, teach them how to interpret images, Beowulf is a great way to, to, to start. Um, I'm sorry, Dory, I think Jess and I put all of our stuff in a row when we did the arrangement. This is mine as well. These are middle middle books for, for um, middle grade books uh, that, aren't, that aren't comic books, right? And so very quickly, Rosemary Suckliff has written hundreds of, I think hundreds, dozens if not hundreds of books. And so this is uh, an adaptation of the Iliad, really geared towards middle readers, has the whole story. It's really, she's a really good writer takes you through it in a sensible, easy, easy to understand way. So the kids have exposure to mythology and they can start making connections in literature that were, weren't apparent to them before. Oh, oops, oh, I go back, sorry about that. Touching Spirit Beer, I read this with my freshmen as well in the high school, but I think it's just as accessible to um, upper middle school kids. And this is about an angry kid, you know, and, and all of us as teachers have had angry students. I'm, Many of you might be familiar with Touching Spirit Bear. And he just doesn't know how to control his anger, and he ends up doing the wrong things with it. And um, instead of sending him to prison, he has a guy who thinks that he's salvageable. And so they send him to an island off Alaska uh, by himself, and he has to survive that island. And, um, and so it's a story of his survival and how he comes to terms with the person he wants to be. Really powerful story, well-written, high interest. You know, kids who have never read another book have read this book. And then Ice Dogs is great. And I think um, one of the things I like about Ice Dogs is that it's written by a woman because that's one of the criteria we're trying, in our, at least in my school, trying to find uh, underrepresented writers. And very often in high school lists, you'll have all white Anglo-Saxon writers. And so we're trying to really make our book list reflect the population. And so this is written by a woman and it's got a, a, a girl who's the protagonist and she's really good at, um, you know, mushing that's the right term right um and so she's uh racing across alaska and she encounters a, a boy who's lost and she has to save him she has to save herself and she does it on her wits and what her father trained her to do and uh really high high interest well-written outdoor story uh with a female protagonist so it hits a lot of great benchmarks that appeal to our more reticent readers uh, where i work the high school classroom so i i added these but i'm sure uh james that you probably have taught some of these or used some of these before as well i know you're a big graphic novel fan um i teach social studies so we don't um at least in the schools i've taught in there isn't often space or it feels like there's not space to have students read an entire book uh, that sort of left to the English department, but I try to do it once a year. Um, and I might, and I don't always get to it with every class, uh, depending on the courses I'm teaching, but I try to find a way for us to have an experience where we do, uh, a deep dive into a book together as a unit. Um, and that has worked out differently depending on what courses I'm teaching and where I'm teaching. So the first time I did that, uh, actually my first year teaching, I asked, I partnered with a school librarian and she ordered um, a few class sets of Persepolis, which came out ages ago now. I think it's like 20 years ago. It's It's been out for a long, long time, but I was teaching um, comparative governments and uh, that can be as exciting as it is for me, a boring topic for some 14 and 15 year olds. They were not super excited to find out that they had to go to class every day and think about different sort of government structures around the world. Um, but one of the governments that in our school that we often included in that, you know, big group of world governments that we looked at was Iran. And Persepolis is a story of a young woman. Um, it starts out when she's quite young, but she is a teenager for most of the book. So a young woman who's living in Iran during the Iranian revolution, and it's a graphic novel, um, really terrible things happen to people in her family. Um, so there, it, it is a very serious text. It talks about serious issues, but it's also a teenager 
And despite all of this turmoil going on around her, she's also concerned about things like, they're not going to let me wear this jean jacket that I want to wear that I think is really cool. And how am I going to sneak, um, sneak like, uh, cassette tapes? Like I, she like is obsessed with like a Michael Jackson cassette tape and how am I going to sneak that in? Um, so what I liked about it is it offered opportunities. First of all, it was a, um, heterogeneously grouped class, which was great. And so we had some kids that were avid readers could read at a really high level. And I had other kids that really could read very, very, very little, um, very little. And because it was a graphic novel and so much of the story is told through the images and the text and images work together, it allowed all of us to access the same text. I didn't have to differentiate the text we were using because we all could engage with it and we all could um, think about what was going on in the story. Um, another that I've used in the past is uh, March. It's actually a series of graphic novels about John Lewis. So I've used that with um, students in both civics and history classes thinking about the civil rights movement. Um, and then this year, this is actually new. It have I, I have not gone live with students with this yet. It's starting after the AP exam. Um, but I am partnering with an English teacher in my school, and we are going to have my 10th and 11th grade AP US history students and his ninth grade English students all read uh, George Takei's They Call This Enemy, which is about... Um, the Japanese internment camps in World War II, and they're going to read it. And his English students might be uh, having some conversations that are a little bit different about all of the things you English teachers talk about. Uh, and my students will be focusing, I think, more on historical context, like what are the bigger stories about uh, what's going on around this. But then we're going to have some shared discussions together and see if uh, those different ages and different courses bring different things to what like do we see different things in the text uh so I'm really excited about that I haven't used it yet with kids uh but I I think it's going to be great yeah if you don't mind my saying all these are great choices and I think for Sepolis in particular uh, there was a young influencer that has just been killed in in, a, in a Iran mm -hmm. or Iraq and so uh her explores the similar issues that um she was mm -hmm. trying to as well and <clears throat> if you don't mind my saying both uh, all of these um, are, are done by master um, comics creators so that the images tell as much of the story as the words. So yeah. that some kids, sometimes when you have an experience, when, you know, they, the images are just sort of depictions of the language rather than part of the story. So these are really good comics. Uh, I'll quickly say these. These are for high school graphic novels. Uh, I love B Durf Dactor. He actually has another comic called um, uh, My Friend Dahmer. He grew up with Jeffrey Dahmer, and he writes a comic book about Dahmer and his youth. And he, they made a, a, a Netflix series about based on that comic. But his report, uh, this whole comp graphic novel about Kent State is fabulous for a nonfiction book, and it explores all of the issues around it and all the repercussions of it or lack of, re or lack of consequences from it. And it's really accessible for high school kids. I had quite a few students that have read this on their own because of um, his great storytelling methods. And um, the, the He-Man Effect by Box Brown, who is great, simple art, but really effective art. And uh, How to Tell the War on Truth by Mark Spital, Sam Spital are both about media and the effects media has on our lives. I'm actually getting a classroom copy of How to Win the War on Truth. He tells all about um, how, uh, you know, advertising and its effect on society and on us as individuals and how we interpret the world and how we assume things about the world around us. When you start to get into uh, more depth about it, you, you realize just how influential media is. And then the He-Man effect is um, is a really powerful, specific exploration of how the He-Man phenomena um, was just made to sell toys, and they they sold children their childhoods by um, by marketing everything. And so the, these are all master, uh, are at least the uh, Box Brown and uh, Dirk Bactor for master. Uh, comics creators. So the stories are, are really appealing and really, they flow well, they're really well done. And then um, this is more of a textbook, How to Win the War and Truth, done in a comics format. And it's really effective for selling uh, anything on visual media and media literacy. 
really effective. I, I'm, I want to get a classroom book uh, set of the He-Man effect as well. I'm really into media literacy right now because of um, the exploitation that's going on with the media. Um, okay, so more comics. These are fiction. I love David Small, master, like once again, a master storyteller. He uses as much of the images to tell the story as the language. And so uh, both Home After Dark, with it, which is about a boy that's been abandoned. So it's um, it's there's nothing untoward in it. It's it, you can actually read it with middle school kids as well. And it's about this kid sort of finds his way in life after being abandoned by his parents. Um, Stitches is a, a little bit. I, I would only read this with high school kids. Um, it's got some images. His his father's a doctor. It's an autobiographical story by David Small, and um, he's got a very uh, neglectful and abusive family that he grows up with and so this is about him coming to terms with it and um it's called stitches because his do dad's a doctor so anytime this little boy has anything wrong with him his dad puts him under a ray uh, an x-ray machine he ends up getting this huge cancer and this throat that has to be removed so he gets like 100 and 200 stitches down the side of his neck as they removed it and so he's lost his voice and so the, the stitches uh, you know have several layers of meaning here but uh, they're, the kids are looking through a book and they do see some naked pictures of people. And so um, just that's really the only racy part. Uh, but, um, you know, it's a comic, so it's not too bad. But uh, I do like to teach comics as content as well as form, not just that, not just the themes. And so for my high school kids, we'll read The Sculptor by Scott McCloud. He also wrote the book called Understanding Comics, which is the gold standard of, of comic study. And so this one um, uses every method of, of storytelling uh, in the form of comics that you can possibly understand or, or possibly use. And um, so it's a great way to teach the form. It, it is a, adult is a relationship from adults. So there are some scenes that uh, I don't think I'd share with younger kids, but at the upper levels, it's very high interest and, and really great way to teach comics themselves. All right, once again, my voice again, I'll, I'll quickly go through these. But these are, are prose novels uh, by underrepresented authors, right? So uh, when I first came to teach at my school over 30 years ago, it was almost all classic literature by by white men, right? That was the lists that we had coming out of the 70s and 80s. And so, you know, we've over the past 30 years, we've been having a concerted effort of trying to get more representative voices. And so uh, a couple of years ago, some students got together and they got some funding for for authors on a reading list that um, that weren't that that weren't represented, you know, or black authors, um, you know, Asian authors, women authors, and so, uh, but they didn't have much experience with books or studying them. So they had a list of very classic books, like by James Baldwin, Going to Meet the Man, and and Ralph Ellison, the the, the um, Invisible Man, and, um, and which are great. But there's so few students that we would get to read those, even at the honors level. So. Um, they helped fund it. They, they matched uh, whatever the school came up with the books, they would match. So we were able to get quite a bit of uh, uh, funding for new books. And so these are the ones that we decided on. Excuse me. The first is a very high interest. I'm not dying with you tonight. It's told from two different point of views. It's written by two women. And so um, one's a, a black girl and one's a white girl. And they're at a uh, football game where a riot breaks out. And so they're telling both sides of that story great read kids kids can't get they can't read it fast enough usually you know um it's not i don't teach freshmen it's taught with our freshman students but the teachers say most of the students finish it long before they're done studying it and um so it's super um powerful current story purple hibiscus a little bit more sophisticated story uh by a nigerian woman uh about a girl's coming of age and um, a lot of the modern issues she's dealing with. And then Colson Whitehead, who's probably one of the best writers of the early 20th century, uh, has written several books, not the least of which is The Nickel Boys, about boys from an, um, an orphanage, or I don't know if it's an orphanage, or um, I can't, like um, uh, a, a, a juvenile house. And um, they're called Nickel Boys because the house was called the Nickel House. And uh, how they're, they just live through these terrible abuses. Um, it's nonfiction. It takes a little while to get into, but once you get past like the first 20 or 30 pages, the kids love it. Um, really powerful stories. Um, I, I put this one on a page by itself because I had the pleasure of seeing Elizabeth Acevedo speak at a, uh, an NCTE conference. And she is one of the up and coming voices of her generation. And this is a verse novel. It's about a young Latino girl and um, she's... Um, 
you know, trying to come to terms with their identity. Um, it's a bit mature. We read this with juniors, um, and they're reading it right now in our class to great effect. Uh, kids, uh, you know, so they're not reading paragraph after paragraph. They're reading poems and the really well done voice uh, of her characters. But what I found, first of all, if you get to see her in person speak, she is dynamite, really compelling, has super stories. She was a teacher, a middle school teacher for a while uh, before she became a, a popular writer. Uh, and she loved to get kids to read. And so she had this one student, Catherine Bolianos, and she she would recommend her book after book. And she would and she was a smart girl and she would read, but she would give the books back and say, yeah, I don't see anything of myself in these characters. I, this isn't just me. And so um, Elizabeth Hasveda wrote this book with her in mind. She wanted her to have a character that she could identify with. And the dedication in the book is to that student, Catherine Bolianos powerful story it does have some mature things that go on nothing un, untoward but you know we study this with upperclassmen um, and uh, some mainstream authors that you might be interested in this is a, a eliza carbone wrote jump which is about sort of a, a girl who's a lost soul and she runs away and starts climbing mount, uh, mountains and she meets a boy who's a bit more enlightened uh, lost in his own right but becomes more enlightened he's able to like see um see people, he sees their auras. Uh, it's not psychological or anything. He just sort of has an, a sense of their energies and he's able to, um, they're able to help each other find their way back to a, a place in life that's positive. Uh, it's just well-written and high interest and it deals with the outdoors. It's written by a woman who has a girl protagonist. So, you know, it, it meets some of the benchmarks we really wanted on our lists because we wanted books that were, that kids would read that were high interest that weren't, uh, you know, you know, European derivative with with long paragraphs and and difficult dictions. We wanted uh, a substantive book that kids would enjoy reading. Uh, for for me, um, I got the adoration of Jenna Fox suggestion from Kathleen O'Dean, who used to uh, before she retired do a lot of the you go to a seminar or a workshop and she'd tell you all about the books coming out that year. And so this is a fabulous story about a girl who wakes up from a coma. And, um, and knows there's something wrong and eventually finds out that her, fa her father was an inventor and he invented something called biogel, which can preserve human organs. And so they actually preserved 10% of her brain and they put it into uh, a, a body that, was, um, that he used his science, science to make. So um, she has to figure out who she is, if, if, she's a, if she's a human at all. And so it's a great companion for Frankenstein because of the monster's origins and um, but it's high interest, easy for kids to connect to and a great way for them to make connections between the two books and, and most scientific themes that we're having to deal with these days. And very quickly, You Don't Know Me, is a, uh, it's written by a, a man about a boy, but uh, the high interest nature of it is really good. It's, you could read it with middle school readers as well, I think, middle school classes. It's about a boy who um, thinks he's all alone in the world. His mother has taken up with um, her boyfriend who's abusive, only abuses him when the mother's not around. And he thinks that his mother would choose the boyfriend over him. And the only person, the only person that, that tries to help him that thinks there's something wrong is his band teacher. Um, and so it's this, it, you know, his terrible adventures trying, just trying to survive this abusive life. Uh, unfortunately, too many kids can probably connect with it, but um, really powerful story. And my last one, I promise, before Dory gets a voice here, and we're running out of time here, so very quick. This is, uh, it's written by Wilming Karaplamutsi about a boy who, um, it begins with this boy who's missing. Nobody knows what happened to him. It is rife with biblical illusions, and it's very high interest. And so we study parts of the Bible, and then we read this, and the kids start to make connections that aren't there. It is, this is a rare find, one of the best books in our and on our reading this very high interest, really compelling and really substantive. It gives a lot to talk about, both in terms of the characters development as well as the deeper meaning when you have things that are connected to the Bible and what's trying to be what, what the commentary that's relating to society. Body of Christopher Creed, can't go wrong with it. Um, so Dory, I think it's your turn to speak. <laughs> Hi there, um, I'm Dory Tripp. I am an elementary music teacher um, in Central Maine, and um, I've been teaching for 15 years. I'm also co 
um, humanities teacher leader fellow with Jim. Um, I just compiled some titles for visual performing arts um, for those of us who teach in this content area, but also several of these books might be of interest um, to anybody um, looking to kind of, you know, cross um, content areas or to kind of enrich content that you are teaching as well. It can be used in any classroom, really. Um, I had to draw upon my visual art colleagues for some good suggestions um, to put up here, and I love the responses that I got. Um, there are, of course, some great books out there that I feel like a lot of um, art teachers probably would be aware of that really introduce um, concepts around like the, the themes of art, you know, line, color, um, contour, things like that, texture. Um, so things um, like lines that wiggle or I'm not just a scribble. Um, there's other great books that kind of help kids um, in, in the arts in general, kind of um, in creativity, embracing mistakes. Um, and having kind of that mindset. So um, Beautiful Oops is a, is a great book to use at the elementary level um, for students. Um, also, Anywhere Artist, um, I actually took a look at this one as a, um, as a suggestion from a colleague of mine. The Anywhere Artist um, is an excellent book um, that kind of illustrates that you don't need paper and paint to create art that you can find and make art anywhere. So this is really about making art with found objects and really celebrating creativity at its finest. Um, some other wonderful books as well, maybe Something Beautiful um, is actually based on a true story. Um, it's about the urban art trail in San Diego, California. And in this story, you know, a young girl who lives in like a very gray, city um, is changed. Her life has changed when a muralist comes to town and brings color and joy and hope into the neighborhood and how that affected the community um, that she lives in, which is just such a beautiful story. Um, and again, the arts being about community and, and sharing with others. It's wonderful. Um, let's see. Simone is another wonderful story. Um, it's based on a Vietnamese girl who was like woken by her mother um, as a wildfire, like threatened um, their home. And while they were seeking shelter um, in a high school gym, Simone had, had encouraged other children and adults in the gym with her to create art and to draw as a way to process their feelings about loss um, in their community and um, like as a therapy for their situation. So um, I love these titles, all of them, The Art of Protest, like how art um, drives social change and social justice too, how we represent um, these movements. Just Like Me is about uh, features self-portraits of um, famous artists in that book as well. So I love these options that my colleagues gave me a variety for various age groups and on and different topics of sharing art. Um, for me, being the music teacher, um, I have lots of lots of ideas. Um, and I try to, although I teach elementary school K through K through five, I try to include um, some things that may be of interest. Um, to all levels as well. Starting off with, you know, younger books um, or younger children, I I thought it might be helpful to my colleagues um, to kind of categorize some of these books. So, of course, there are lots of books out there um, for music. And, you know, I love using picture books and stories in music class. I think sometimes people might think the connotation like, oh, well, we learn music, like, when do we have time to read stories, right? But um, you incorporating literature in the classes is something that I do on a daily basis. So um, stories with recorded music is a great way to get students to really listen to classical music and paint the image of the story that the music is trying to tell. 
Um, and after, you know, a few examples like this um, in the Hall of the Mountain King or Never Play Music Right Next to the Zoo, I love that story. That was actually written by John Lithgow. And um, if you're not familiar with Storyline Online, um, he actually reads this story as well. Um, it's fabulous. Or the Carnival of the Animals, after they've had this example of like the imagery that music can create, then putting on other songs and having students kind of create their own image in their head. What what story is the song trying to tell? It's a wonderful way to model that. Um, then we have a, a category that we call song tales in, in the music ed world, which is basically like folk songs that tell a story. So I love this version of Puff the Magic Dragon, um, Peter, Paul and Mary beautiful whimsical illustrations it even comes with a cd um, that kids can sing along with and then a well-known music educator john Feyerabend, has a whole series of folk songs that um he put to picture book actually he taught at the university of hartford um, at the Hart School of Music, and there's also the Hartford Art School there. And so he did this as a scholarship with um, student artists at the Hartford Art School um, as like an illustration contest. So these songs like uh, The Fox Went Out on a Chilly Night, Over in the Meadow, um, all of these songs put to beautiful illustrations. And they're stories that kids can sing. Um, so composer and musician features, I uh, I use these a lot and I love them. Um, Trombone Shorty is a wonderful one, actually written by Trombone Shorty himself, a story of his life and how he be, he came to fame as the tiniest little child prodigy on trombone playing jazz music. Um, Squeak Rumble Womp Womp Womp, that was written by Witten Marsalis. Um, and again, it's taking in sounds of the of the city or the sounds all around us to make music. Um, Drum Dream Girl is based on a true story. I love this. It's about a young girl who loves to play the drums, but she is living in um, a place where girls are not allowed to play drums. Um, and so it kind of takes her on that journey, um, eventually becoming one of, one of the very best bongo and timbali drummers there is um and little melba and her big trombone another great feature there as well um and i know we're a little bit over time so i'm going to try to wrap up as quickly as i can um i also use a lot of books in my classroom for social emotional growth or growth mindset um for example i'm in the midst of concerts right now it's concert season in a lot of our schools um, and our young people get really kind of anxious and nervous about concerts and so we read Maya in the stage fright and it kind of talks about the strategies um, that Maya uses to kind of overcome those feelings of anxiousness like taking deep breaths looking for a familiar face in the audience and all those things um, your name is a song I do want to mention that one this is great this is kind of hits several chords, um, so to speak. This is about a child whose name is always mispronounced uh, by the adults in her life, her teachers, her classmates, and things like that. And her mother, and she's very discouraged, but her mother tells her, you know, your name is a song, it has beauty. And so they practice saying names of the people around them rhythmically and sing song like. And I actually have used this story with my students to create our own unique compositions um, based on the names of, of our classroom community um, that we've performed in concert. So this is a great one as well to make connections with. Um, Jim, you can move to the next slide. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then social justice, um, music just like art um, is, a wonderful way to, well, not only, you know, express feelings, but um, promote change in our world. And so um, all of these stories are, well, most of them are ones I've used in my classroom. Um, Building an Orchestra Hope is about a man who built orchestra instruments out of trash 
um, for his his community. His students really had no instruments to play um, and could not afford to buy instruments. But um, again, thinking climate and, and waste lived near a landfill that was um, quite a problem taking over um, their community. And so he used what he had and, and actually built instruments for his orchestra and they st they play concerts today. This is, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. It really opened my students' minds, um, you know, to possibilities they didn't even, even realize. Um, Change Things, this book is by Amanda Gorman, um, who was the presidential inaugural poet. Um, this story is about like a young girl who leads others on a musical journey um, and learning that like they have the power to make change. I love this story um, and set to music, it's, it's lovely. She says, I can hear change humming in the loudest, proudest song. I don't fear change coming. And so I sing along. Um, my students love that as well. And then We Shall Overcome, um, is an illustrated, it's basically illustrating the lyrics to um, the widely performed um, like civil rights anthem, right? And so um, this is often performed at protests and rallies. And so this is a great um, kind of illustrated version of those lyrics to sing along with. Rise Up and Sing, again, power protest and activism music. And actually, if you go to the next slide, Jim, this is my last one. Oh, I thought I had another one. No contact. I don't, oh, maybe, oh, maybe that's the one I was thinking of. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, Rise Up and Sing, this one's really good for teens. Um, and you know, thinking of songwriting, but it features like current artists that they will know, like Beyonce, Billie Eilish, Lady Gaga, and more, but also touches upon, you know, other eras of music, Nina Simone, Neil Young, Bob Dylan, Tracy Chapman, and just features like the important role that music plays in activism um, and how music can create change. So, those in a really, really quick nutshell, uh, those are the books that I I recommend. Um, and if if anybody has any questions, I am happy to dive deeper um, with anybody who would like to know more. All right. Thank you, Dari. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to skip to this part. I, I, we can still have a discussion, but some of you may have to leave because we're a little over time. But there's a survey and contact hours that you can um, that you can fill out here and we'll post this on our newsletter the next few weeks and we'll post it on our website so uh, you can fill it out at that point if you need to. We have a chat. I put it in the chat as well okay. the link to the survey. Yeah, okay, thank you. It's very brief. Um, but you do get uh, professional hours. But uh, we can um, have a, a share discussion if you want. I'm gonna stop the share at this point and, uh, and sort of open this up to everybody if you want to contribute or if you have some great books you wanna share. And, um, and and contribute. Would you more than happy to talk about it? Uh, Patricia said, "Thank you. You're very welcome, everybody." Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I think one of the most difficult things. I'm a a pre K to eight teaching principal, and sometimes we just don't know which book to to go with next. All right, so you've given me some great ideas. Thank you. Which one did you like the best, Debbie? Well, we've been doing some work with a group called Island Readers and Writers, and they will bring into our small schools an author and an illustrator. And much of it has been picture books. Some will be novels. But uh, I really like the ones that you were talking about with music and building on that. But I also saw some of the middle school pieces, the history book piece, because um, like the suffrage play list, um, the sufferist uh, playbook. And then a lot of our kids like graphic novels. So, you know, how far down can we go with Bomb, um, The Secret Project? I haven't read any of these. 
because I teach math and science. So maybe that's why, but I wanted to be able to get some information to share with my teachers as we look for curriculum ideas for, you know, the future. So I appreciate that. I also wondered, I I'm writing down the titles, but do you have a, a list of the books that you've shared that you could send to us? Like the titles? Well, we'll we're gonna I'm gonna put this document onto the newsletter and the website, so then okay. you have access and the and the, there's links on each you know, most of them anyway. So. Okay, so we can go back and see them. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm going to unrecord. I'll stop the recording, and um, I appreciate. I appreciate everybody's patience with us. Oh,